writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry. Oh, restore us. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Re repair its breaches for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee it, flee to it from the bow. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. God has spoken in his holiness with exaltation. I will divide up Shechem and portion out the veil of Succoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter, Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout my triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you tonight grateful for your grace and your work on our behalf. Grateful, Father, for the power of the resurrection. Even as we gather here tonight, we are reminded of what we heard this morning, that we rest in your strength and your strength alone, that you brought us to life through the same power by which you raised your son from the dead. So, Father, tonight I pray as we lean into your word that you would give me strength and clarity of mind. I pray, Father, that we would grow in our understanding of what it means to call upon your name in the midst of difficulty. Even as we seemingly have victories, we know in this life that there will yet be setbacks, but we know that all of those are in your mighty hand. In Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Be seated. Psalm 50 is the, uh, excuse me, 60, is the last of the Psalms with a historical setting from the life of David. Um, and it tells us a little bit that the beginning here, that the introduction um, that is actually included, uh, tells us a little bit about that background. Um, this is a this is a, a time when David really is experiencing great triumph in his leadership of the nation of Israel. Uh, David has been king for some time by this point. Um, and it's, it's historically significant that uh, as he has been king for some time, that we would have this psalm. Because without this psalm, everything else that is recorded in the word would leave us to believe that David was just living in absolute triumph. And there was no real difficulty from about 2 Samuel chapter 8 in. And that this was a great time in his life. But... We find something juxtaposed here to the realities that are written elsewhere about uh, what David is experiencing. We would, we would just come away without the psalm, thinking through David's life, thinking that he was just experiencing absolutely uninterrupted military victories. And yet here in Psalm 60, we have two very strange observations to make in contrast of the setting being in 2 Samuel chapter 8, uh, set in the background of David's victories. One of those observations is that um, in the title, uh, it says that this is about victory. Look in the title. When Joab, on his return, struck down 12,000 uh, of Edom in the Valley of Salt. This is saying there, there is a victory here, and yet in verse 1, the psalm is clearly about defeat. Oh God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry. 
Oh, restore us. Uh, so there is this tension there. The, the, the title declares that this psalm is ultimately about a victory, but it begins in defeat. That's odd. The second observation, again, is that the title sets the psalm against uh, the backdrop of David's greatest military victory. And, and leading in to try and give you the Cliff's Notes version of 2 Samuel from chapter 5 to chapter 8, leading in uh, the historical background here, there are several things going on that you, I think you need to be aware of. In, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, David becomes king of Israel. In verses 6 through 15 of chapter 5, he conquers Jerusalem and makes it the capital of Israel. In verses 17 through 25, he achieves decisive victories over the Philistines. In chapter 6, David brings back the Ark of the Covenant so that the people of God can worship God himself. And then in chapter 7, Nathan is sent to tell David that his throne will be established forever. And it is clear to David what this means. This means that the Messiah will come in his lineage. I mean, think about that. The utter just excitement and joy that David has to be feeling at this point. And then you lead into 2 Samuel chapter 8, and it is all about David's decisive victories. And in verse 13 of 2 Samuel chapter 8, and David made a name for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Saul. Then he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom, he put garrisons, and all Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. So the question is, if this is about victory, and this is set to the, to the background of this overwhelming military victory, why in the world does the psalm start out, Oh God, you have rejected us. You have broken our defenses. You have been angry. Oh, restore us. What? what what in the world is that about? Well, what we gather here is that what probably is going on is David is away fighting in many other um, places. And he gets news that the Edomites, knowing that David is no longer in Jerusalem, have risen up uh, in rebellion against Jerusalem and staged this uprising. And so David dispatches Joab and sends him to defeat the Edomites. What we learn from this particular psalm is what we experience in our lives, and that is even when we live in victory. And as Christians, we live in victory. God has won the victory in Christ. But even in the middle of that victory, knowing that God will give us everything that he has promised us, there will still be days of difficulty. There will still be areas of our lives that need to be brought under the subjection of Christ underneath his lordship. So the psalm is clear that we experience setbacks and defeats even in the midst of victory. And this next week, I'm going, Sarah and I are going to be in Virginia. And I'm a little bit of a military history buff, especially when it comes to the Civil War or the American Revolution. And so anytime we go out east, I make sure that if there's a battlefield anywhere where I can talk Sarah into allowing me to go, that we visit there. And I am like a kid in a candy store right now. Because this coming Thursday, I believe is the 18th of October, will be the 237th anniversary of the um, negotiation of the 14 Articles of Capitulation in the Revolutionary um, War. And, and what's interesting is the guy, John Lawrence, that, and I'm actually on Thursday going to be standing in the house where he made these 14 Articles of Capitulation. I know, nobody else cares. Um, but I'm going to carry my wife and my daughter along with me. It's going to be so awesome to have a table set up there. Probably not the real table, but okay. Um, have everything laid out. And what's interesting, though, is that the very man who stood in George Washington's stead and negotiated, 26 years old when he did this, 
I, I thought about that this week. Like, what 26-year-old would we ever trust to do anything? <laughs> like, we fought an entire war, war. Let's send a 26-year-old to go negotiate the terms of surrender. Nope. Not going to happen in our day and age, right? But this 26-year-old man goes and he negotiates the articles of surrender. The war has been won. And there's so many geeky facts that I think are so cool. One of them is that Cornwallis sends to General Washington. See, this isn't even really, this is just me geeking out on preaching. Cornwallis sends to... Uh, Washington and says, can we just have 24 hours of surrender, uh, of ceasefire, so that we can kind of gather our thoughts about what we're going to do. And Washington sends back, he says, you can have two hours, and you can come to negotiate terms of surrender in those two hours. I mean, talk about the brass to realize we can't give our enemy down. Anyway, very interesting that this young man um, was sent to negotiate the Articles of Capitulation. But in all of that victory, the climax of this young man's story is that less than a year after he did that, he shot off of his horse in a, in a small skirmish as the British are leaving for the final time. So even in the midst of victory, as the revolution had been won, as the surrender of the British had come to pass, John Lawrence, 27 years old, is killed in battle. Kind of unexpected, but in the scope of human experience, this happens all the time. We experience defeats even in the midst of victory. You see, so often when we think about talking about the victory that we have in Christ, people think that for that to be real, it has to be absolute and utter victory in this Life, and that's just not what we experience. So we see clearly that this psalm is juxtaposed to all of the the winds that David is experiencing, so that we might learn that we will have to be even in the face of our greatest victory. See, we don't know the particular. Um, we don't know the particular background to exactly what happened in verse 1. You have, you have rejected us, broken down our defenses. You have been angry. We don't know exactly the battle that um, David is speaking of here. But if we look at verses 2 and 3, he describes with very powerful imagery what this Edomite rebellion has done to the nation. The first thing that he, the first image that he uses in verse 2 to describe what's going on is that of an earthquake. Look at verse 2 with me. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches, for it totters. You turn on the news, and there's earthquakes in Haiti and California and all different places of the world, and you just see rubble and ruin and fires and walls that have fallen down. And that's the picture that David is giving. Here, that, that, that the nation is in rubble and ruin, that, that those who have come to battle have torn down the defenses, have killed those who stood up to defend its walls, that fires are really burning. There's an earthquake-like repercussion from this particular defeat. And secondly, he gives the image, and this is interesting, of drunkenness. Verse 3, you have made our people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. The absolute shock of this defeat has just made the nation of Israel reel on its heels. It, it, it's bewildering what has come to pass in the, the nation of Israel. But what's interesting is that this whole image of drunkenness at the hand of God's wrath is somewhat normal in the Old Testament. Psalm 75 verse 8 for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he, he pours out from it. And all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Isaiah 51, verse 17. Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk the dregs of the bowl, the cup of staggering. This idea that God's judgment poured out against a disobedient nation brings them to the point not of spiritual pride but of just being unsteady being unsure about what's going on the wrath of God 
Joe is often pictured as a drunken stupor. But the most devastating thing that I think David is aiming at here doesn't come in verses 2 and 3. It doesn't come as David is describing the earthquake or the, the state of feeling and a drunken stupor from all of the effects of this battle. The real hard truth is where this judgment has come from. And that is found in verse 1. It comes from the kingdom of God. Oh God, you have rejected us. You have broken our defenses. You have been angry. And so David here calls out to restore us. Now, we can see, especially from verse 4, that God's not angry with everyone in particular. I don't think that there's any reason to believe in the narrative of 2 Samuel where David is um, in chapter 8 again. He's experiencing great military victories. I don't think there's any reason at this particular point for us to believe that God is angry with David, with the leader himself. God's also clearly, look at, look at verse 4. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. What, what David is clearly painting a picture of here is there are faithful people inside of the nation of Israel. There are faithful individuals, and yet they have experienced, along with the disobedient uh, individuals who have caused this, the wrath of God to an extent. So what we see clearly is that God, at times, in a very just way, will judge an entire nation even though there is a obedient, faithful, God-fearing remnant left in that nation, God will, for his purposes and for the good of those who love him, bring a nation to its knees because of the rejection of his authority. And you remember Israel's defeat at Ai because of Achan's disobedience at Jericho. Charles Spurgeon said this when it comes to, to verses 1 through 3, and just, I mean, the intensity there of what is happening to Israel. Spurgeon says, to be cast off by God is the worst calamity that can befall a man or a people. But the worst of, of, of it is when a person is unaware and indifferent to it. Friends, think about our nation now. Absolute judgment in so many different areas, and yet our nation is absolutely indifferent and in many cases unaware that God has even pronounced judgment. But what we can rest in, what we can, what we can be grateful for, is that the very writing of Psalm 60 in and of itself leaves us with hope knowing that there was a man who was aware of the unrighteousness that was going on in the nation and the anger of God against that unrighteousness and his just punishment for it. And so David here cries out to the Lord on behalf of the nation. David here asks for God's help. Now I think we have to stop here just for a minute. And I know that these are weighty verses, but we have to stop and I think that it's right to apply what we have read so far to the church in, in some respect. Churches fail their potential often because a group or a portion of a particular body is entrenched and engrossed in sin that they refuse to repent of, and it weighs down the effectiveness of that particular church. Churches are torn. Um, I don't know how many times. When I was in college, Second or maybe it was the third semester, I found out that our college had been at one time 1,500 people in the mid-90s. It dwindled down to 800 in the course of about two months. And I thought, well, something had to have happened. Well, it was a split between two particular leaders. And my thought was, leave it to a bunch of Baptists. I mean, educational institutions normally don't sp split. But leave it to a bunch of Baptists. You put us in there, and we'll, we'll allow it to split over something. And that happens all the time in churches. People are divided. Um, the entire denominations, friends, I, I have seen brought to a point where I think at best you could say they are on the sidelines because of individuals in leadership 
who are not being obedient to the very word of God. And friends, I just want to encourage you too, just because there are leaders and people in movements that are ungodly like that, don't have the attitude that, well, everybody from that movement, we can just write anathema on and walk. I've interacted with a lot of people from varying denominations who I believe uh, in an official sense have swerved from true biblical doctrine. And yet there are people who are being faithful, staying with those groups, not because they agree, but because they're trying to call it back. Because they're they're trying to bring uh, some sense of honor to God's word, even uh, from the trenches. And so as we think about those particular situations, sin in the church, division in the church, error in the church, the question is, what in the world do we do? Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to make sure that we are not the ones that God is upset with. We are not the ones who are engrossed in sin causing division, um, deceived in our own thinking and error. We have to be circumspect and pray and ask God to show us our hearts. But the most important thing that we can do is found in verse 4. Look at what David says. He says, you have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. The idea here is the gospel. That in times where churches are being divided over a number of things, that when those errors or those sins or those factious members come against you, the the, the inclination in our flesh is let's go to war. But the calling of David here is rally around the banner that God has given you. And the banner of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the banner of the gospel. I don't think that it's I don't think that it's without intention that David here pins Selah or stop and think about these things. Saying, pause and make sure that you are not the cause of division, that you are not the one who is living in unrepentant sin. You are not the one in error. And then if you aren't, are you focused, church member, completely on the banner of the gospel? Not just in defeating what you think and putting things right, but are you focused on the gospel itself? So we see clearly here, in the midst of great victory, David and the nation of Israel experiencing an overwhelming defeat. And yet David, I think, lifts the head of an entire nation as he reminds them, you have set up a banner for those who fear you that they may flee to it from the bow. (coughs) Secondly, we see in verses 5 through 8, somewhat 9, an appeal to God and then an answer from God. David appeals on the heels of verse 4. He says that your beloved ones may be delivered. Get salvation by your right hand and answer us. He cries out to God as we have been defeated in this battle, as these Edomites have come against us, as the error, as the sin, as the division comes into the church, God, it is you and you alone who can protect us. Our eyes are upon you. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. God, save us. And and then quickly in verses 6 through 8, God does answer. God has spoken in his holiness. With exaltation, I will divide up Shechem and, and portion out the veil of Zephah. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter, Moab is my wash basin, and upon Edom I cast my shoe, over Philistra I shout in triumph. I think what's interesting here is that immediately, All of the devastation, the difficulty, in in the midst of spiritual victory, we experience defeats. And what do we do when we face those defeats? What David does is he pivots from the difficulty, and he does what he often does in the Psalms. And he turns to the living God. He pours out his heart, knowing that the victory can only come from God. And immediately, as David calls out to the Lord, what does God do? He speaks. He turns and he answers David. 
Now, there are a lot of different ways that people have parsed out verses 6 through 8. What, what does this mean? Uh, is, is, this, is this really literally an oracle where Nathan or another prophet of God would have heard from Jerusalem, from God himself, and taken this news to David? Or is this just a looking over what God has promised and then superimposing it into David's song? Uh, which side is it? Friend, to be honest with you, I don't think it matters. I think the picture that we have is clear. Uh, what is most important here is that the word of God, verses 6 through 8, this is, this is an illustration of all of God's promises. God has already told the nation of Israel, this is the land that you will have. This belongs to you. I will give this to you. So this is the word of God, whether it was spoken through Nathan or from what had already been recorded in Scripture to this point, the Word of God is made the basis here for the expression of faith in verse 5. Do you get that? Verse 5, that your beloved ones may be delivered, give salvation by your right hand and answer us. And God answers. It is the very living Word of, of God that David rests his heart upon. He doesn't come and, and try and figure out in his own strength how to win the spiritual battle. David wants a word from God. He wants to hear God's voice. Friends, faith always seeks its foundation on the words of God. What God has spoken is what we can rest in. Biblical faith, and, and, and I think Brother uh, Gage did such a great job a couple weeks ago of pointing out that biblical faith is not this just blind optimism. Biblical faith is not just striving to have positive thoughts. Biblical faith is believing the word of God and then acting on it. And that's what David is doing here. He is trusting in the midst of the battle that God has spoken in his holiness, in his perfection, that everything of his nation belongs to the Lord, and he is going to give David the victory. He trusted that God would give him that victory. He trusted that he could send Joab out. We were reminded in the title that Joab here is the one who ultimately is sent out to war against the Edomites here. And what David believes is that God has already spoken. God has already told us that the battle is won. Yes. Friends, how, how, how much more effective would we be for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ if we would look at the word of God in that way? If we would look at what God has already spoken, believe it, and walk in life. If we would... Tell people about the redemptive work of Christ and what he has done, the reality that they're sinners and that they need salvation by his grace and his grace alone. What, what if we took God at his word again? What kind of spiritual battles could we see won in our own day? This psalm is not just written here so that we can all go, wow, David had great faith. This psalm is written that we might rest our hearts on the living word of God as well. That our prayer of faith in verse 5, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand. Answer us. What if gospel ministry was empowered with a heart like that? Trusting on the word of God. Friends, I, I want you to... And there's so many ways that I could illustrate this to you. But all throughout church history, for the past 2,000 years after Christ ascended, as men and women have believed and walked by this book, the entire world has been turned upside down. I mean, nations have been radically and drastically changed. Not because some pastor came up with some new program or new thought process or better way of this or that, but because the word of God was proclaimed with clarity and people believed it and lived by it. There are two lessons here that I think we close out this song with. And we hear David crying out for an answer, and David finds that answer clearly in the word of God. But as we move past verse 8, 
and come to the third stanza here. I have to ask you a question. When exactly was this psalm written? Was the psalm written um, after David had experienced the victory over the Edomites for a while? Was it written years later? Where exactly was this placed in, in the narrative that we're talking about? The answer is we don't know exactly, but we can learn something from verse 9. Look with me. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? David is not writing this psalm after he's already experienced the victory. David is writing this psalm before he ever gets to the battle. David has sent Joab out to claim the victory. David has sent Joab out to go to war against the Edomites. And he said, son, you go. I'm right behind you. And David is writing in, in, in verses 5 and verse 6 through 8 with this complete, and, and then the rest of, of, of the third stanza in there, with this complete confidence that God will <coughs> ensure the victory of Israel. That God is going to take up our cause. David's not writing here in retrospect. He's not writing after the battle has already been won. He is writing this as he is writing it. And so the question I think that matters most is, what was David thinking? What, what, what can we learn from his thought process in these last four verses? One, I think we can learn that only David understood in so many ways. If there's nothing else that we learn from these past 60 psalms, hear this, that only God can ever give the victory. In our American Western mindset, we read, who will bring us to the fortified city? And we go, okay, fortified city. Big deal. It is a huge deal. The fortified city that David is talking about is Petra. The, 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 the only way to get to this Edomite city, to get the victory, to win the battle, was to go through these limestone channels that had been cut in mile-long paths. And there would have been Edomites on either side to absolutely crush anyone who was coming through this narrow path. Humanly speaking, what David is saying is, this isn't going to work out, humanly speaking. <laughs> We're going to go through this narrow hallway of limestone, and we are going to be absolutely and utterly obliterated. Friends, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in 2018 makes absolutely zero sense apart from who God is. Apart from his power, apart from his authority, apart from his moving, the church alive in our culture today makes zero sense. And what David is saying here is, is, look, in human terms, there's no way to win. But I think what we capture in David's thinking is David isn't thinking in human terms. He's not looking to himself for the battle for for the for the victory rather. Look in verse eleven. Oh, grant us help against the foe. And listen to these words: For vain is the salvation of man. We can't do anything in our own power. We can't accomplish any meaningful spiritual victory on our own. But if God is with us, we have all the victory we will ever need. The victory has already been. Decided. So only God can get victory. We learn that second. Very clearly. We must ask for that victory. We must turn and, and beg God to give us the spiritual victories. David learned that only God gives a victory. And simply to, to have that victory, we must ask for it. And so that's exactly what David is doing here. Listen to him crying out for victory here. Who will bring me to this fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you rejected us, O oh God? You do not go forth, O oh God, with our armies. O oh, grant us help against the foe. For vain is the salvation of man. David is depending radically on God for his deliverance. There is not one ounce or iota of I can do part of this. This is God. You must win this battle. Now, knowing 
the God who has delivered David from so many spiritual and physical national tragedies in the past, David has absolute confidence that this victory will come to pass. David doesn't go like we do often to God and pray like he will. <laughs> All right, God, I know I'm supposed to be here, and my, my pastors told me I should have a prayer line, so I'm going to ask that you save my neighbor. I really don't think you can do anything with that guy. I mean, he's a mess. It's not, not, not much hope there. It's not how David's praying. I don't know if you guys remember the, the, the movie Miracle on 34th Street. The little girl asks for a house, and she's sitting at the end of the movie in the backseat of the car, and she's saying, I believe, I believe, it's silly, but I believe. That is the modern American church in a nutshell. I believe, I believe, it's silly, but I believe. That's not the heart of David when he goes before God here. He is asking and depending and trusting, believing that this battle will be won by the hand of God. And listen to how, he, how this is expressed in a positive expectation in verse 12. This is a good verse. I mean, talk about a, a complete difference in, in tone from verse 1 to verse 12. Listen to David's word here. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. David knows that the battle is won in Christ. Now, here's the difficulty for us. At LifePoint Baptist Church in 2018, you and I are not leading Israel. And I doubt that anyone in this room has ever even seen an Edomite. So you're going to go home tonight and, well, you know, the Edomites aren't really a big deal for me. Because we are in a battle to advance the kingdom of Christ. The purpose of church is not to come together so that we can have our ears tickled or so that we can be pleased in our flesh or that we can have the kind of church service or whatever that we want. The idea of us coming together is that we would be equipped to go into battle. That we would seek souls for the kingdom of Christ. I read this this morning, but I think it bears repeating. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says, for well, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not the Edomites that are concerned, but against the rulers, against the authority, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's what I want you to think about. And as, as I walk through, and I, you know, the Lord is continually taking the psalm on Sunday night and matching it providentially. I didn't plan any of this matching it perfectly with what we're talking about on Sunday morning. Friends, we're in a spiritual battle and we learned this morning that we have all of the power of the universe in the resurrection of Christ. How much more confident David looked back and he saw a few armies vanquished. He saw a few battles won. He saw some cities destroyed that were coming against him. We in the pages of scripture can behold the resurrection of the living God. How much more confidence should we have when we come and pray to God? How much more should we tremble before the Lord and ask for the spiritual battle, the, the, the spiritual victory, rather? How much more should we come and pour our heart out for our friend who is outside of Christ, for our co-worker, for our nation? James said it right in James chapter 4, verse 2. You don't have because you do not ask. Jesus said the exact opposite, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Trust in the Lord. He will win this battle. Friends, we must remember that we have been given the greatest banner of all time. That we have been given the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we must pray for its advancement 
into the world. Think about that when we read verse 4 of Psalm 60. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. The, the, the imagery of a bow there. And, and this may be a little bit far for, for some of you, but the idea of a rainbow, some have, have, have explained that, and I think it's helpful. That that's God's promise that he would never flood the earth again, and, and a bow, a weapon of war, it is aimed now at himself, that Christ came and bore our punishment, that all of the wrath of God poured out on Jesus for anyone who would call upon his name. The victory in every spiritual battle is sure because of the atoning work of Christ. So how much more tonight, Life Point, as we come to verse 12, can we say, remembering the resurrection of Christ and the power that we have been given in the gospel, how much more can we say with David, with God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our Father God, we come before you tonight grateful for your grace. Grateful that we know that every ounce of the victory belongs in your hand and your hand alone. For those who are yet outside of Christ, who have not come to saving faith, God, we beg of you to bring them to saving faith. But we know that you will do that through means. And so we ask that you would prepare our hearts our wills and our minds to be those very means of the proclamation of the gospel. That we would go out and that we would fight in the spiritual battle, proclaiming good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that everyone who comes to that man will be saved. And Father, we pray tonight knowing that we will do valiantly as we submit our lives to you, knowing that every one of our foes all of those who are opposed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will tread under your feet. It is in you and you alone that we have the victory. Stir in our hearts a passion and a desire to see others come to Christ. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song.